Well, we're entering into a <laughs> section of the book of Hebrews that seems almost to be a conclusion of a lot of what we've read since chapter 1. So I keep asking week after week after week, at least most of these weeks, for us to be reminded as to why the book of Hebrews was even written. Why was it put in this, this text? And I know that the scholars who tried to piece together the Bible and decide what should go in the canon had a little bit of problem deciding if Hebrews should be there because they couldn't kind of decide who wrote it. it but, but finally it was put there. Can you tell me again why the book of Hebrews appears to be written? Because these people, Greg says, are, are giving up on Christianity. They have been in it for some time, and they have maybe allowed Satan to have his way in their life, or maybe they've just grown weary with a lot of things that go on in life, and they've gotten tired, and they just decided that they don't want to be a part of it anymore. Now, is that, is that common? Is that common in this life? Now, it's really, really common. And, and it could happen to any one of us. Uh, we, we think uh, it might not, but we remember Paul saying, you, you need to be careful that while you think you're standing, you end up falling. Remember how he said that to the Corinthians? You, 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 you could fall. You think you're standing, but be careful. <clears throat> and so people apparently are coming to Christ and they're, in, they're involved in the kingdom and they're involved in little groups like this and they're enjoying things and all of a sudden, for a variety of reasons, they give up and they walk away and you can name people who have done that. You probably can name people that are close to you who have done that and you may be able to name people in your own family who have done that. It's just so common. But how do you think God really feels about that? And the only way I have to describe it is maybe get a sense of feeling kind of like this. Have you ever, have you ever given someone an item that to you was a treasure? I mean, it was really, really special. And it was so special to you, it was really difficult to part with. You, you, you. And yet, you, 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 out of your own love for this person, you, you gave them this gift. You, you let them have it. And you find out just a short time later that they have squandered it. They've wasted it. They gave it to someone else. They sold it. If, if that's happened to you, how did you feel? If it hasn't happened to you, how do you think you would feel? <clears throat> oh, you would feel a little bit betrayed. That, that may be the best word we could come up with tonight. You would feel betrayed. You would feel violated in some way. And feeling violated and betrayed produces what kind of emotion inside of me? Anger? Yeah, I, I can kind of get angry. And so when you reach out to help somebody so much, and you're trying to give them the best you can possibly give them. And they, they take it and act like they really love it. And they do seem to enjoy it for a while. And then all of a sudden they just toss it aside. It, it just seems so disrespectful. It seems so hurtful. Well, this passage is about God's emotion. This passage is, is talking about God's emotion in this very kind of a circumstance but the thing that God has given more precious than anything else now the interesting thing in this room in this room God has given to every single person talents and abilities that are so unique and so special that make you or help to make you who you are when you're at your best God has given those to you but that's minor. That's minor. Because what he's given to each of us more than anything else is the freedom from our own wickedness and sinfulness and salvation from it. And he's given us an inheritance that's wonderfully great to look forward to. Uh, did it cost him very much? 
it cost him sending himself in the form of his son to this earth to live among the people he had created, to live like the people he had created, and to suffer with the people he had created, and then have those people he created beat his son up and literally destroy him. He let his son do all that so that our sins would be gone. And it's a special, special gift like none other. And so in verse 26 of Hebrews chapter 10, you find some of the strongest language in anywhere in the Bible. And you can go to 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 20 through 22, and find the very same thing in a, in a very, very quick snapshot. But it's not as detailed as right here. If we deliberately, he says, keep on sinning after we received the knowledge of the truth. Now, everybody capture what that means. I'll not get through all this tonight. It, it, time is too short for that. But if we deliberately keep on sinning after we received this knowledge of the truth, the implication there is it's not just we received the knowledge. We received the truth. We received Jesus. We came into this kingdom. And we're excited about this newfound salvation. But something happened. Satan happened. We just got tired of it. And I'm telling you, we all get tired of it, don't we? Uh, we, we, we? We get tired of going to church. We, we get tired of doing a lot of things. I mean, we, we just get tired of doing stuff like that. And we get tired of praying about something and the answer doesn't seem to come so quickly. And we finally give up our, throw up our hands and say, I don't know. Uh, we just get weary with stuff. If we keep on sinning after we receive the knowledge of the truth, here's a big problem. No sacrifice for sin is left. No sacrifice for sin is left. What that means is you're now on your own. You're now on your own. And you may like that thought for a moment, you may really like that thought for a moment. I'm finally free. I'm on my own. But I'm going to tell you, not many of us do very well on our own for very long. We always end up needing help. We need something. We're on our own, in this case, with our own sins. Now, <clears throat> that may not sound too, like, too big a deal to a lot of people because we have absolutely trivialized sin in our world so that sin is not that big a deal in so many arenas of this life. Everybody understand that? It's just not that big a deal. Uh, Kim Boggs asked me, he said, why, why don't you teach a lesson on hell or more than one lesson on hell? I told him I probably would do that for too long, just for him. I figure he needs it. No, no, I, not so. It's not, it came out wrong, Ken. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's totally. <laughs> but it's a good point. It's a good point because if you're left on your own to try to take care of your own sin problem, you're going to be totally unsuccessful. And the future is really ugly because the only way we're going to make it is that there's a sacrifice for our sins and we can't make it a sacrifice. We don't know how to do it. So he explains more, more. So what you have is only a fearful expectation and judgment and a raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. So what do you think that's talking about? It's talking about what Ken mentioned before we start eating. Let's talk a little bit about hell sometime. Well, you might start there. There's a whole lot more to start to talk about. But if you're going to deal with your own sin by yourself and you don't have the sacrifice of Jesus, he says, here's what it's looked like. All you've got to look forward to is a fearful expectation of judgment. It's not going to go well. When you know you're guilty, when you know you're caught red-handed, and you know you're guilty of something really big, 
and you're going in front of the Punisher, how do you feel? Look, you're, you're, if you're not afraid, you're not right in the head. You know, you just you're afraid. You know, so you you're, it's a fearful expectation of judgment. And after that judgment, guess what you're going to get? You're going to get this place that's called a place of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Now, I thought I was an enemy of God when I came into the kingdom. I thought I became a friend of God, a child of God. Yeah, that's right. But when you choose up to leave the kingdom and go back on the other side, you suddenly find yourself as an enemy of God again. He said, remember, remember how it worked under Moses' law? That's what he's going to say. Remember how it worked under Moses' law? Now, again, that should capture their attention because they've known Moses' law from the bottle forth. I mean, they, they, they were born into this law. They knew it backwards and forwards. And Mo, Moses had a law that said, anyone who rejected the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Rejected the law of Moses means you just disobeyed it. I just broke the law. And so if you had two or three witnesses that said, Ricky has broken this law and he ate more than he was supposed to eat tonight or whatever the law is, two or three witnesses, there's no question. We just go out and usually stone him to death. That's the quick way. We just go stone him to death. Uh, now, if, you, if under Moses' law, it was that quick, if it was that sudden, and if it was that easy to find someone guilty, and, and witnesses who were honest witnesses would say, yes, they're guilty, and the person perishes because of it, how much more severely do you think will, will happen if a man who deserves, how much more severely do you think a man deserves to be punished who has trampled underfoot the Son of God, who is treated as an unholy thing, the blood of the covenant that sanctified him. Now, you need to underline that word that sanctified him because there's some people who read this passage and say, well, these people really aren't Christians. They, they never, no, no. This says, these, we're talking about people who were sanctified. That means you were set apart. That means you're taken out of darkness into light. You're moved out of the world of sin into the kingdom of Jesus Christ. These people are members of the kingdom. Now go back to what I said earlier. i got to quit in two minutes here. Go back to what I said earlier. How do you feel when you've given something special and someone mistreats it? Here's how God feels. How much more do you think a man deserves to be punished? He has trampled underfoot the Son of God. So as God is looking from his throne, and he looks down and sees Ken Jones, who has been sanctified, walking away and deliberately sinning and saying, I've had it with this life. I'm going back to something. He said, it looks to me like you are trampling under your feet the gift that I gave you. It looks to me like you threw it on the ground and you stomped all over it. Uh, that's why you're going to face the fiery expectation of judgment and the fire that follows. So, wow. Mm -hmm. And you treat it as an unholy thing, this blood of the covenant, the blood of Jesus Christ. That's the covenant, the blood of the covenant that's, that originally set us apart. And one other phrase, and you've insulted the spirit of grace. You've insulted the spirit of grace. Now, that's an interesting concept. Where have we said over and over again for five years now, where have we said the spirit is living? Right now, where is the spirit living? Inside of us. Inside of those who have been sanctified or set apart. Those who have been, we commonly say, saved. Those who I call all the time members of the kingdom. The spirit lives inside of us. And we put insult to the spirit who's inside of us. It's like we say, we don't care if you're inside of us or not. We, we don't. I'm going to do what I want to do. 
So I trod underfoot the Son of Man, and I throw insults at God who lives inside of me. Do you think this is serious stuff? You think this is really serious? That last verse, though, scares me to death. Verse 31, I was going to get ahead next week. But no, that's good. It says, it's a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Yeah. It's going to be one of the scariest ones to me. Yeah. Because that's your hell story again. That's your hell story again. Of what it means to fall into the hands of a living God. This fiery, fiery pit that's going to destroy us. It, 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 I don't know. I don't like to I don't like to speak guilt kind of lessons. I don't like to guilt people in anything. But I do like to speak everything with reality. Here's reality. I tell everybody everywhere and every business and every part I talk and every family, unless you know reality, you can't make a good decision for tomorrow. Unless you know reality, you can't make a good decision tomorrow. This is reality. So if you're thinking about quitting, this is reality for those who quit.